Welcome to the Witness History Podcast from the BBC World Service. Today we're taking you back to an uprising against communist rule in East Germany. It's June 17th, 1953, and there are tens of thousands of people marching in a divided Berlin. The physical wall has not been built yet, but the city is split into two halves. The west controlled by the Americans, French and British, the eastern side by the Soviet Union and East German GDR. Demonstrators from East Berlin are singing We're on our way to Pankow, home of the communist East German government. This is where their protests are directed. A reporter from Radio Berlin is among the crowds and describes the scene. There are women, men, teenagers, some of them have open shirts, and they're coming directly from work. That's at least what it looks like. They have briefcases. Come over here. They're all very friendly. Nothing is happening here in the West Sector, so they don't have to demonstrate. They're all walking past so quickly. Nobody wants to have a conversation with me. They're all in a hurry to get to Pankow. This huge show of protest is sparked after a decision from Moscow to increase production quotas for East Germans without increasing their wages. A worker explains. The situation is that tools have been downed in all factories. It started with the construction industry, the main street for building work in East Berlin, the Stalin Alley, started all this. We, the colleagues, have of course declared our solidarity with them and downed our tools too. So that was in 1953 and I lived in Berlin. I lived in the middle of the city. Helmut Strecker is 21 years old. He's a student finishing his high school degree and planning to study business and economics at university. Both Helmut's mother and father are communists and supporters of the party. In his memory of 1953 East Berlin, Helmut doesn't remember being affected by the economic problems like food rationing, which are prevalent in East Germany at this time. I was engaged to the woman who is now my wife, so I spent a lot of time with her in her flat. Her sister was a costume designer at the opera house, and I'd started going to the opera and taking an interest in culture. So that was how I lived, really. We went to the western side of Berlin a lot. I had many relatives there, my grandmother, several aunts, so I would visit them or they would come over to us. Things were pretty open then. People were allowed back and forth. But there was, of course, a difference between the East and the West. For example, if you wanted to eat a bit more chocolate or bananas, then that kind of thing you could find in the West, but not in the East. Helmut also has little contact with the masses working in East Germany's factories and heavy industries. Nein. No, I was not a member of the workforce as such, because I was part of the trade and commerce sector, expected to be a white-collar worker. But on June 16th, 1953, Helmut and the factory workers meet each other on the streets of Berlin. He and his fellow students are instructed by the headmaster of their college to go out into the protesting crowds to persuade the workers gathered there to get off the streets and go home. So we arrived at the university that morning and as soon as we got there, we were called into the assembly hall and everything was explained to us by the head tutor of the school. And so we were told that we had to join the marches. And it wasn't only us. There were also other students too and officials, definitely officials. And who knows who else? But anyway, we were told that we should join the demonstrations to talk people out of protesting. The idea was that we would break up the demonstrations. In Helmut's mind, the protesters' demands are not realistic. This is about what people have become used to. The factory workers went onto the streets because their normal hours were increased. In other words, this meant less money than usual, and that's why they were demonstrating. This was a problem, above all, for the construction workers. 
But as far as I understand, on the 16th, the government took back that order. So if their main demand had been met, why were they demonstrating? I think it was just to show their power. It became about their wanting to have the same things as people in the West. They just wanted to have the same good cars, the same good bicycles, that sort of thing. Of course, these demands were a long way from what was actually possible. There had been repressive changes introduced by the East German government a year earlier, in 1952. Many people had been sent to prison for religious and political reasons. There's also a collectivization of agriculture going on, causing food shortages. Tens of thousands of people across the whole country are unhappy, so they join the uprising, which gathers pace over the next 24 hours. The focus is widened from wages and pay to political demands, and there are calls for the East German government to resign. There were thousands of people, and slowly things began to escalate. Let me give you an example. There was a police cordon. Maybe 30 officers had formed a barrier and a man went up to them who was obviously one of the workers. He was carrying a shabby old bag, I remember. He told them he wanted to go through and they wouldn't let him. So there was a bit of an argument and in the end, one of the policemen took out his truncheon and started beating him with it. So now you can imagine the crowds around them got angry when they saw this. So these 30 policemen needed to find a way out of there. And as the hours went by, things got more and more serious. By late morning, we couldn't really talk to the workers anymore. And it seemed as though something was about to happen. East German police give instructions on a loudspeaker for the crowds to disperse and go home. When they don't, Helmut sees Soviet tanks rolling into the city. I don't know how many there were, but let's say about ten. They moved into position in front of the government ministries building. Then a hatch from one of the tanks opened and an officer appeared. He started talking, but it was in Russian and so no one could understand a word he was saying. Then someone threw a stone at him. So he went back inside and closed the hatch. After that, the tanks closed ranks and started moving towards the people. The only thing to do was run. Another reporter for Radio Berlin is also in the crowds. Inzwischen haben die Demonstranten alle transparente und The demonstrators have set fire to all the propaganda banners and hoardings and there are clouds of blue smoke rising into the air wherever you look. Right at this moment to our left the windows of a large store are being smashed. The East German police are shooting to force the demonstrators back. man was hit by a bullet and has been driven back in a car by the transport police. All the time the police are asking people to leave Potsdamer Platz. It's thought 55 people were killed as the Soviet tanks moved through and crushed the uprising. In the martial law that followed, many more thousands of East Germans were sent to labour camps and subsequently died in the aftermath. Helmut's belief in communism was not deterred, though, and he stayed living in Berlin, where he became an economist. Helmut Strecker was talking to Nina Robinson for that edition of the Witness History podcast, first broadcast in 2011.